Good afternoon, my name is Mercedes Cardona. And uh, among other things, at the moment, I am the editor of uh, Lean Back, which is the Economist Group's uh, marketing and media blog. We are at economistgroup.com slash leanback. That's the extent of my sponsored content for the day. <laughs> we are a hub for marketing professionals to share ideas about omnichannel marketing and uh, how it's all ruling our lives these days. Case in point being what we're here today to talk about, which is targeted communications. And uh, I'm here with Elaine Lawson from MasterCard and Brenna Robinson of Pfizer. And together we will keep this conversation targeted to targeting. And just to start, we've all heard the story, which is now almost an urban legend, about the uh, parents who found out about their teenage daughter being pregnant because Target was uh, living up to its name and managed to extrapolate the information from some of her shopping data and, uh, and sent some offers to their home. And you know that's an extreme example, but targeting is becoming more of the norm these days when it comes to all kinds of communications. It's the name of the game for marketers. You know, spray and pray just doesn't work anymore. And there's so many more channels and many more tools to do it now. So you know, we're here with Elaine Lawson, who is VP and business leader for US digital marketing for MasterCard. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, I believe you're in charge of all, sort of all the digital, social media, mobile initiatives in both earned and uh, I guess it's earned and paid. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's MasterCard.com, and what else does that include? Um, well, we have our Facebook channel. Um, we have our Twitter handles, at MasterCard and at Priceless. We're on YouTube. We're on Foursquare, Instagram. We're, <laughs> we're social. Um, <laughs> we're a very social brand, even mm -hmm. though we're new. Uh, you know, just to point out, we just literally started, um, we, we literally launched our social channels, and not all of them, by the way. We launched with Facebook and Twitter in 2010. So, so we're still, we're three years old. We're still a little baby. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're learning. We're doing a lot. We're testing and learning, and it's, it's been fun mm -hmm. and scary, but fun. Yeah. So what are some of the initiatives that you are engaged in in, in all those channels? So we have uh, a big program right now called Priceless Cities. I don't know if anyone has seen any of the Priceless New York advertising. Uh, we, we actually are launching a Giants TV spot because that's, you know, seeing the Giants up close and personal is priceless. Um, so the Priceless Cities programs, which sent around right now four cities, we're hoping to launch more in New York, Chicago, L.A., and Los Angeles, uh, where you can experience everything within that city. So whether it's culinary, whether it's shopping, whether it's sports, you know, whatever that city has to offer, we're giving you the opportunity to take advantage of it as a MasterCard card holder. So we might be promoting that across our social channels, but there's obviously the above the line support as well. So there's a consumer brand team that we partner with who do, you know, the TV, the print, the radio, the out of home. And of course we have a social overlay and there's a digital overlay as well. So there might be search, you know, paid search is part of that. There might be display, there might be um, uh, a website, you know, we might have to do a, a Facebook app, you know, and if we do a website, we make sure it's in responsive design because we know that a lot of consumers are, are accessing content, you know, on their phone. Uh, there might be mobile, uh, a mobile application uh, that we need to do. So we partner uh, with different teams mm -hmm. Uh, to kind of, you know, make the digital and the social elements kind of come to life. So, so that's a, an example of one program, but there are other things that we do that are outside of a program. So again, you know, working with our community managers, we work with an agency um, to manage our, our social channels. So, um, and that's not only pushing out content, but also listening to consumers uh, in terms of what they have to say. Um, finding out, you know, what the interests are, you know, there's, there's passions, you know, that, that people are passionate about, you know, whether it's sports, whether it's music, you know, and a lot of times we're able to fulfill on that, whether it's through the Price of Cities program, whether it's through some of our sponsorship uh, properties and assets, we can do that. Um, and everything we do, we always try to 
delivered under the halo of Priceless because that is the MasterCard brand campaign that's been going for like 16 years now, if you can believe that. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. so that's kind of what I do. Right. And uh, we're also joined by Brina Robinson, who is with, uh, she's Pfizer's Senior Manager, Digital Communications and Media Relations. Is that correct? Yeah. So <laughs> I'm part of, uh, you know, a larger team, not large, it's about five to eight people, not all full time, that work on our digital and social communications um, for Pfizer corporate. So that's sort of how we manage um, any initiatives that come through Pfizer, Pfizer social channels, Pfizer websites, um, and kind of that stuff. Right, I assume that you're not doing a promotion with the Giants. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what are some of the efforts that you engage in as part of the uh, communication strategy? Yeah, well, I mean, as a highly regulated industry, which I know many of us probably in the room are, um, we want to engage as much as we can, um, but certainly stay within those guardrails set by our legal and regulatory teams and, you know, external regulatory bodies that we obviously don't, um, you know, want to break any rules. Um, what we do is use social channels to the best of our ability in terms of engagement and something that we really push every day to engage as much as possible through Pfizer channels. And then also listening is something that we do. Um, we were listening and trying to find a way that we could engage with our consumers where we can't on a brand level, just something we mm -hmm. can't do. So we listened and found that there's this conversation about aging and aging well and being healthy, which is obviously the kind of the issue of our time with an aging population. And so we launched a campaign called Get Old. Um, and it's totally above brand, but it provides us an opportunity to really have one-to-one -one conversations that we can't other places, where we can respond and retweet, and it gives us that mm -hmm. kind of flexibility to have true engagement. Right. All right, so let's get started then with our discussion. I'm going to ask a few questions, but uh, I will hope that the audience will make this interactive. So if you want to follow up on something that was said, just raise your hand. Or, you know, if, we, if you have an example of something that you've done in your company or something that you've noticed that you want to share with the group, please uh, just raise your hand and uh, we have microphones there uh, in the back of the room. Just uh, please wait for the microphone to make its way to you and uh, we will all share your insights and your thoughts. So let's keep this interactive and uh, I'll start with one question, you know, sort of the overarching one is the idea of sort of market segments and demographics is sort of increasingly becoming irrelevant and uh, we're learning, you know, we're leaning more towards sort of an individual approach to customer engagement and communication and it's sort of more personal, more global. How have you changed in both of your companies, your communications and engagement strategies to deal with this new world that we're in? So, uh, and maybe we can start with MasterCard. Yeah, I'll start. I'll start. Um, start well, this way and work it's, out. It's kind of interesting because, you know, I work at, at MasterCard and um, the model, you know, for the business model for many years was really to get our uh, financial institutions, i.e. the banks, uh, to issue the cards. So there is heavy focus on that. And there still will be, continue to be a heavy focus on that. Um, and I would say another big priority is to focus on the merchants because you want the merchants to accept the card. Um, as a, a brand, you know, I would say third priority really was the consumer. You know, because at the end of the day, you know, if the banks don't issue the card and if the merchants don't accept the card, you know, there really is no relationship with the consumer because we need the consumer to use the card. And I'd say that that's changed over the past few years, that there is an increased uh, focus on the consumer. Uh, and even though, believe it or not, as MasterCard, you know, if you have a card, and hopefully there are some MasterCard card holders in this room, uh, the when you're spending and you're doing your transactions as an individual, you know, I don't, I don't have your identity. Actually, your, your bank that issued the card has your identity. So, um, so having that relationship with the consumer has, has really uh, burst wide open for us with social. Um, it has given us the opportunity to kind of have that dialogue with the consumer um, and to engage with the consumer on a whole different level. Uh, because really the relationship was more or less with the banks, you know, so so that has been kind of a shift for us that social has allowed us as a company, as a brand to really engage with consumers. 
Um, and, you know, I talked about some of the cool programs. You know, there's a customer service element as well. You know, believe it or not, there are a number of people, you know, when I got the job in MasterCard, they're like, oh, you know, they turned off my card, you know, and I'm like, I actually can't help you with that. We actually get questions like that from consumers. We can actually help them. We have a customer service division at MasterCard. We work with them to kind of feel those types of questions. Um, so it's, it's actually really helped us. Uh, it, it's helped us learn more about our consumers, their wants, their needs, help, you know, assist with customer service. So, so it's really been great for us. Yeah, I mean, I think on, on a similar front, um, you know, as, as Pfizer and Pharmaceutical Company, we don't market directly to individuals. Um, but we realized, I think, that there was sort of a gap in that no one knew who, who Pfizer was. Mm -hmm. People could name our products, especially some of our very famous ones. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's all that we were, and I think as a company that's as, as large as Pfizer is and does as much work as we do, even beyond you know just pure pharmaceuticals in the health space, it was important for us to have a face and a name. Just because we mm -hmm. can't reach out to someone about a product doesn't mean that they don't. We want them to know who Pfizer is and have a good mm -hmm. connection with us. Um, so it gave us an opportunity to engage in a way that we couldn't before. Right. Um, gave us an opportunity to really see in terms of targeting who these people were that were interested in topics like us, rather than marketing to, you know, a persona of, of a brand person that's 20 to 25. We actually, there's a human being that exists, mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. that provides a lot, of, a lot of insights in how we relate to them. So it's, it's really an opportunity, instead of us kind of guessing what people want, right. we can actually see it in real time. Mm -hmm. So the demographics are dead. It's all about the person then. Um, you know, with these new levels of personalization that we're seeing, your customers are now in charge, and that seems to come through through the uh, remarks you just made. You know, they're, they're in control of your brand, in a manner of speaking. Mm -hmm. So how do you accommodate that in your strategy? How do you co-opt the, uh, in a way, the consumer into uh, helping with the brand building and the, uh, and the brand maintenance? I, I see the consumer as having a say in our brand. I wouldn't say that they have totally total control of the brand, but I think they have a say. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Rightfully so, right? Because we're in business, you know, because of the consumer, right? Um, you know, they're using our products um, and services, programs. We, you know, they should have a say. Um, so I welcome that. And, you know, I, you know, I remember you know, back in 2010 when we were trying to launch our social channels, I mean, we're in financial services, so you can imagine our legal, you know, is very conservative and they were very, uh, you know, not really excited about us wanting to launch some social channels. Um, and I remember the, the comments of, you know, what if they say negative things? Um, how are we going to respond? You know, you know, maybe we don't want to hear this. You know, we might get ourselves in trouble and we're like, you know what, they're going to be talking about us anyway. So my, we might as well be there and know what they're talking about because they're going to talk about us anyway. Uh, so, you know, I, I do feel that, um, you know, and like I said, that's why listening is, is so important. You know, we do push. And, and I remember in the beginning, we didn't have a listening. We were, you know, pushing out the, con you know, we were in the really baby steps, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we were pushing out the content. Now it really is important to listen. Uh, to what consumers are saying, you know, are we resonating, you know, are we striking the wrong chord? Um, and I think it's important to turn and pivot where necessary, you know, sometimes you can't, you know, sometimes it is what it is and you can't, but when you can, you know, I think that that's where you really make that, you know, those connections. Mm -hmm. So listening and flexibility yes. would be uh, right. key principles for right. you. What about you, Brina? I, I think it's the same, I mean, to always say listening, but it's almost more than that, I think, listening on two fronts. One, we want to know what they say about us. So that's kind of the obvious part. We want to know what they associate. Um, and then we also kind of want to come at it from the back as well and look at people that we want to be communicating with mm -hmm. um, that maybe aren't talking about us. And frankly, a lot of them probably aren't. But <laughs> we would prefer that they do. Yeah. So let's look. We looked at them. I think there's always that individual. And then there's that kind of it's the, always the small data and the big data. So you have the small bit, just that one individual. And there's the conglomeration of what they talk about. So it, it goes as far as finding influencers that we're interested in, mm -hmm. analyzing their conversations, the keywords they use, what they talk about, the channels that mm -hmm. they utilize them, and, and then shaping a program to target those, those people. 
and you know, for what we do, it really is above it is above brand. It's, it's a reputational campaign for Pfizer and about about who we are. And so we know who we want to work with and who we want to have relationships with. So finding out what they're used to hearing, what they want to hear, means that we can create content, we can create platforms, mm -hmm. we can do advocacy and partnerships and things that that work for them. So it's it's kind of switching the platform and, and realizing what people want and then fitting it to their needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned that you're in a very highly regulated yeah. industry. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're both in highly regulated yeah. industries, you know, both financial services and pharma are heavily regulated. Yeah. Does, does that play a role in just how much personalization and how fast you can, you know, to, the, to your point of being nimble, you know, how fast can you pivot when something happens, when you have to run it by legal? And, you know, just how personalized can you get when there are regulations about how much of detail of data you can share? Yeah. So, uh, Brina, you want to take that one first? Yeah, certainly. I think I'll, I'll be the first to say it's always an evolving process, mm -hmm. something that we work with our, our counterparts. <laughs> I mean, really in all teams, but bringing people along for the ride with you, especially in terms of us mm -hmm. for legal and regulatory, is, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, We've managed to have some pretty good successes. I think, uh, you know, certainly we do require legal yeah. review. Mm -hmm. That's just a fact. Yeah. However, for some initiatives, we have been able to determine guardrails, as we call them, so that we have sort of a green zone, <laughs> um, and then the yellow zone and the red zone. And if we stay between the green zone, something as simple as uh, using the corporate initiative get old handle to retweet, we can do that. And it seems like such a simple win, but it's really a huge win. Because um, if you're asking you know, permission to retweet someone or asking permission to engage on that level, it's really hurting your engagement. Um, and then I think it's really education as, as we work with legal and regulatory mm -hmm. teams. I mean, they're, they're lawyers. Why would we assume that they're that they experts at social, mm -hmm. yet we come to them to advise us on our social activities, which almost doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so educating them is as much of, of an effort and kind of getting them excited about the social space in, in this example so that they want to help us make it work rather than you know want to shut it down. There's a million reasons that you could say no, but how do we let them see the upside of yes so it's worth their effort? Mm -hmm. What's well, it like in MasterCard? <laughs> um, I think we have the same lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they're working together with Pfizer. Um, so we're kind of in a similar situation. I think that for, um, you know, we, we have, you know, just to echo what you said, I mean, we have guardrails for some things that we do, like that, uh, like the Priceless Cities program. There's guardrails. We know what we can say, how we can promote it. We don't need to show every single tweet and every single Facebook post to legal because we've kind of set the guardrails for that. But there are other programs or initiatives where, you know, we may need to uh, consult with legal um, on the best approach and then we can kind of move forward, you know, so that might be more in the yellow zone. Um, you know, where there are, I'm going to say, you know, if there's like a, a crisis, crisis might be too strong, I, ha I haven't been in a crisis situation, thank God, uh, since I've been at MasterCard, but if there were some type of issue, a hot issue, um, you know, we actually consult with our, not only legal, but our corporate communications team who have um, social channels as well, MasterCard News, you know, um, so we will kind of partner with them. So it might be that they might be pushing the message. It might be more appropriate for them as opposed to us, you know, pushing out a message. And maybe we just retweet that, you know, um, in support. So we're, it's, it's a team, it's a process, it's iterative. Um, you know, sometimes, again, you have to turn and pivot depending on the situation, but, um, you know, it, so far it's working. Yeah. So uh, it sounds like, you know, this leads into a question on, you know, what's the communications approval process like? Sounds yeah. like you get pretty well involved with things like legal and compliance officers. Right. But are there also sort of technologies and tools that can help streamline the process <laughs> or, you know, help you, help you move through that? communications process a little faster? I wish there were some tools. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the tools are, you know, people, I mm -hmm. would say, at this, at this stage. Um, you know, we, there, there is a team 
a small team, you know, in, in digital and social, um, who, in, in marketing who, for the U.S. who kind of manage all of the programs, all of the content, everything that we're doing. Um, so it literally is us kind of partnering. I mean, it's, it's cross-functional teams working together um, to ensure we have, you know, the best content, the best outcome, you know, on social. So, but we don't use tools, you know. Yeah. I, the t I, again, I think the tools are the people. I mean, I was going to say, <laughs> this, this email account, uh, because we definitely use that. Uh, so I think I, I probably second that. I mean, in terms of technologies, if there's some sort of technology to make, to make this easier, mm. I mean, let I us know. Love to hear let about us it. know about it, yeah. Um, but, you know, our approval process is relatively the same whether mm. we're approving any sort of content that goes externally. Social doesn't get a pass. It right. doesn't get treated differently, which mm -hmm. I think is normal, right? There's nothing that generally mm -hmm. our, our corporation or any large corporation would shoot externally without having some eyeballs at it, no right. matter where you put it, and right. for, for good reason. Um, but what we have done, which is not techie at all, <laughs> um, is especially with something as large as Pfizer is, and you know we're at the, the corporate level, but there's, there's business units, and under the business units there are brands, and there are brand managers, and so mm -hmm. it gets very sort of spread out. What we have tried to do is introduce policies and procedures, best practices, things mm -hmm. that everyone can use so that we know that a lawyer that's over here in this brand team will, mm -hmm. and this is still in progress, give the same answer that someone over here in this brand yeah. team will. Because mm -hmm. we came up a lot of grunts, people saying, no, you can't do that. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And then, as you know, these are individuals. They're, you know, they went to law school. They have their own opinions about what is and isn't right. right. So that's what we are still working on doing with a company that's as large mm -hmm. and has as many uh, lawyers and, and masters as, mm -hmm. as we do. And I think that's proven to be helpful. Um, you know, we do te we schedule things in advance online, socially. Obviously, we all do yeah. that. So that's mm -hmm. not interesting. Um, <laughs> well, but we also have the issue of sometimes, you know, things like robo-tweeting, yeah. gone awry uh, and uh, yeah. you know these automated responses when people tweet to you and yeah, you know, we'll, especially with customer mm. service can be a little we, we certainly don't do that we don't backfire. either um, we don't do that either i mean we do build out a calendar a week in advance yeah. i wouldn't do it any longer than that again i led a bunch of social campaigns in you know my previous life and, and several pr agencies um you also never know when there's going to be a crisis right so unrelated to you even um if there is a, a national tragedy of some kind mm -hmm. a big issue and you're tweeting mm -hmm. about something that's really really inappropriate right. and lighthearted, that yeah. comes off as, as, as insensitive very, very yeah. trite mm -hmm. um but a week in advance gives you time and i think if you're if you're you can outsmart the legal system by figuring out that next thursday there's going to be an event and it really requires mm -hmm. you to just have more forethought i think because you can't day of, think, oh, you know what's happening today? There's the TV show that's launching or something. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So, um, see, before we move on, let me just uh, look around the room quickly and see if anybody has any questions at the moment. And going, going, going once, twice, gone. OK, we'll get back to, the, uh, to my questions. And um, I mean, just pract in looking at practical, you know, we were talking about tools. What about, you know, do you use a sort of shared services model when it comes to taking care of your communications needs and, uh, and your communications function? You mentioned having a team, right. but that team needs tools. So uh, just uh, what, what do you see as the benefits and risks of going through a shared services model when it comes to sort of sourcing those? And uh, just... Do you do you fear losing some of that customization that you want if you if you start using shared services? I, I mean, we <laughs> we do we do have particular tools that we mm -hmm. use uh, to help us with monitoring. Um, we have an after hours service uh, that we use. So I'd say those are kind of some of the tools that we use, but it, re it really is people um, who are very involved because it really is, I feel social is like kind of high touch, you know, that's a high touch area, you know, so someone could post something um, and maybe it's a question about something, maybe it's a complaint, maybe it's they're happy about something, you know, and I think it's all about, you know, the response 
with the potential. Sometimes you don't need a response, but sometimes mm -hmm. you know you need to respond. Um, and I think that you know we have people to do that. You know whether it's you know myself. You know, hopefully it's not myself because I have a lot of other things to do. But it's it's our agency. You know it's working with our agency to kind of help us with that. Mm -hmm. You know they've been trained. You know they know the Mastercard way. They know the Mastercard speak. They know, you know. Um, and they know in the particular situations how to respond. Um, so, um, I mean, I don't know if, if there's anything. Well, yeah, you I, mean, want I think to all add. Of the yeah. same things. You know, if anyone ever sells me, or like the vendors sometimes do, anything that that's automated or that right. that mm -hmm. knows things automatically, just call BS on it. Um, I don't think that there's. <laughs> I don't think there's any yeah. there's anything mm -hmm. that exists that has the same ability to process as the human mind does, right. mm -hmm. especially one that's familiar with with a complex and, and detailed brand. Um, which you know we all have in, di in different levels right you know in terms of what we do share obviously you know w what's interesting from a Pfizer perspective is we have Pfizer handles but um, besides our consumer colleagues which is you know the chapsticks of the world yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know the other teams don't don't have social channels right. because of, of regulations um, we all or most of us listen so mm -hmm. right now there's actually been a there's a varied model so certain people are using certain listening things we're trying to make it consistent so that we're all getting the same information mm -hmm. the same way which i think will, will help again with that consistent response ideally you know we try to work with best practices where you know from an hq social digital team we have best mm -hmm. practices we're a center of excellence that we can work with the brand teams to educate and, and to give counsel, but the execution actually lies within each team, mm, which yeah. allows for, you know, that real personalization. So if someone's mm. working, we've done a lot of blogger engagement lately, you know, all the brand, but, you know, from, we're not going to reach out to a, a blogger to talk about a certain health issue, um, first of all, because we'd be doing all the blogger outreach for a gigantic company, mm. um, but we're not as adept at it as some of our colleagues that work in that space all the time. So hopefully we kind of guide the path and the process and at least consult it in the mm -hmm. thinking and then they sort of go and execute. So that's kind of how we balance that. And, uh, you know, we talk about, talked about, you know, listening and what about measurement? I mean, you have oh, to at some point, well, at least once a year, there's mm. a budget that has to be yeah. squared away. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so what, you know, how do you show the value of personalization and targeting? You know, it's, it's a bit of an elusive concept. Uh, so are there ways to say, you know, before personalization, after personalization, here's, especially, I guess we should start with Brenna because as you said, you're not targeting consumers yeah. directly. So mm. you're doing image work. How do you measure that and yeah, show? Yeah, we're doing reputation, which I think, mm -hmm. I, how do you measure reputation? <laughs> um, it's, it's challenging, of course we have to. So that's, that's kind of not an option. Um, whenever I talk social and digital, I always call measurement the holy grail, because um, we're all working at it. And I think yeah. we're all evolving it if we're doing our jobs all the time, because there hasn't been a great answer yet. Uh, you know, there's several ways we cut at it. One from reputation, we do do surveys, um, large reputational, very complex that measure us against competitors in the industry and against certain points. You know, in one of these scales where we try, like where you measure sort of ac access points that people like um, individually. When we're talking about the smaller social digital work, we're fi trying to find a really good way to make that valuable so mm -hmm. it's it's easy and in, in, in our in everyone's metrics I'm sure people have been asked to increase the number of followers the number mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. likes um, you know we're trying to focus more on a social engagement metric <coughs> where mm -hmm. it's really how much engagement do we have versus the number of followers which is something that I think is be, mm -hmm. being highly adopted where if you have a million followers and no one ever likes your content or shares your content or comments on your content, right. that's that's not highly valuable because right. if you know if you ever liked a page on Facebook, it's in the corner, maybe you see it every now and then, but with a the new algorithm, frankly, it's not gonna pop up in your feed right. all that often. So if no one's commenting, then the value low, although it's great mm -hmm. to look at that million points um, <laughs> and say, I did a great job. So we're focusing now on how many actions do our, you know, do our fans take divided by how many fans there are. So does each of our fans on average do two actions? Um, and then mm -hmm. that's the metric that we try to measure against. Also worth noting with, with advertising on Facebook, 
it's really easy to game the system. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if you're trying to beat competitors, which we found ourselves, you know, all the time with our kind of our set we're measuring against, and someone mm -hmm. doubled 60% in two days, we know that that was advertising. Mm -hmm. So do we lose then? Do we win because mm -hmm. they had advertised you? Do we get to say that's not fair? Not really, because that's part of our industry is advertising. <laughs> so it's that's what I think we have to consider when we talk about the value of those is the ways that the system can be changed. So really it's about engagement um, in terms of a dollar value, which is the, the whole ROI part of it. It's mm -hmm. really difficult because we can't, we're not getting leads, we can't track it back to a product. The mm -hmm. product goes through a prescription, it goes through a doctor. Um, and we almost don't want to. I think for us it's really about the reputation and awareness um, and measuring those year over year to say that we've done these things now and through activities people are more aware of Pfizer, they think we have a better reputation, they respect us as a company who provides health and science and good products. And I would say, just to, uh, to piggyback, uh, measurement is, is, again, it's the holy grail. Like we, we have to measure everything. We do have to show sort of a return on investment. I think if it were, uh, if we didn't have to answer to senior leadership, we would just be focused on engagement. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we wouldn't care as much about how many followers we have or how many fans we have on Facebook. Uh, so it's a balance for us. You know, we try to increase both. I mean, I remember when we, this was last year, and we hit on Facebook a million fans, and we were so excited. And I remember our CEO said, we need five million fans. And we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, that, you know, the excitement turned to being deflated. Now we've got to get 5 million fans. Um, so, so it's a balance. I mean, we, we do feel engagement is important, you know, as Brianna mentioned on Facebook. Like, just because someone likes you, you know, it might have been maybe you put out something cool and they like you and they never come back again. I consider that bad, you mm -hmm. know. I want the engagement from that person. I don't just want them to like me, right? I want them to love me. <laughs> um, so, uh, so engagement is really key. So we do have uh, metrics in place to kind of measure, you know, how many people are sharing our content or clicking on the links within the content um, that we that we post. Um, and again, each of these channels have their own metrics, you know, that we throw in there. Sometimes you can take some of it with a grain of salt, like Twitter. Um, but you know, we include that as well and. Overall, for MasterCard, we do have these large sweeping brand tracker studies, and social is part of that. You know, so it, you know, it used to be maybe just a TV commercial aired and you saw the spike. Well, guess what? Social is actually laddering up to a lot of the spikes that we see um, in terms of consumers liking our brand or you know saying you know what if I have a MasterCard you know I would use that card or I would apply to a master apply for a MasterCard because I really like what MasterCard is doing socially and, and you know it's a brand that you know uh, it, it likes me you know I would like this brand so so measurement is very important we unfortunately can't get away with it especially when budgets are shrinking mm -hmm. and you're fighting for your piece of the pie mm -hmm. yeah well it's is it evolving as well? I mean, when we talk about tools, are, do you see anything in the horizon that may actually help you sort of show the value of personalization to uh, it, it, give it a number or something similar to an, an index of some kind? Or are we still uh, not there yet? I don't, I don't think we're there yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, there are certain tools that we use for, you know, listening and, um, but, in terms of the, the engagement that we have, it, re it really is people, you know. Um, we're people, our consumers are people, and again, I, I really do feel that social is very high touch, uh, mm -hmm. and I think it, that, that's kind of why it's like that. I would love if there were a tool that could, but then it would put someone out of a job, though. But, um, <laughs> but I would love if there were a tool that would make it easier, mm -hmm. um, but I haven't come across one yet. So let's circle back then to the, uh, the pregnant teenager at Target oh. that we talked about at the <laughs> beginning. Uh, just, you do all this personalization, all this customization, where do you draw the line between being personal and engaging and building an emotional connection and just being creepy and stalkery? Oh. <laughs> how do, you, how yeah. do you avoid, where do you draw that line and how do you avoid crossing it? 
I mean, in my opinion, in my experience, very rarely, and I was struggling today to think if there was an example that I had reached out to someone and they hadn't appreciated it. Right. Um, people want to know we're listening. Two, they want to know that we care. Um, and those two things, if you've ever been contacted by customer service when you were upset, tend to diffuse things, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're so angry, and then someone calls you, and you know, and you're like, oh, oh, well, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> because you really do sometimes just want someone right. to say, yeah, mm -hmm. we, we get it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you know, we get that from the Get Old campaign because the name is Get Old, and sometimes people it was intended to be controversial. Mm -hmm. People get very offended. We get <laughs> emails, and you know, we'll write back and say, great, we really do appreciate your feedback. It was kind of the point of this. Thanks. Um, please keep telling us what you think. And you know, never has someone replied back with anger at all. So I, <laughs> and I also think in today's day and age, we're all used to being open books, online especially. Um, if you have created a public persona online, I think that we anticipate being contacted. Uh, you know, I always say I use the channel that they use. So if they're contacting me via, you know, via email, I do an email. But Twitter mm -hmm. for Twitter, um, you know, I'm not going to try and find their email somewhere. That would be creepy. Um, but besides that, people like it. You know, ironically, the, the tool that I wouldn't use would be only one of them would be the phone. You know, it's, it's quite the opposite. <laughs> if we can, if they give me a number, like I'm contacting them exactly on how they contact me, mm -hmm. and I've never had anyone be upset about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I haven't either. Um, but so I, when it, they call you, you send an email from Mastercard. Wait, people don't get freaked out. I, I think. I think again. I think it's the function, maybe, of the industries that mm -hmm. we're in. You know, we. And again, I already um, mentioned that. You know, if someone has an issue with their their card got cut mm -hmm. off or got to, you know, that's not us. Actually, you know, we <laughs> actually uh, you would have to call your bank. But um, I think that. In the instances where we have reached out, it's it's almost been kind of a surprise and delight mm -hmm. for that person. You know, um, you know, I can think of, you know, a number of situations where you know, customer service again that always mm -hmm. kind of comes up because, that you know, I'm reaching out to Mastercard because it says Mastercard on my card, even though there's a Citibank on top of it or mm -hmm. Chase. You know, um, and they're not thinking to call the number on the back of their card. They're reaching out to us. You know, and they might be complaining you know, about something that happened to them. Um, and us reaching out, it, it immediately diffuses that situation. It's almost like thank you, you know. Um, and very rarely, you know, is that person kind of still angry about it. They're actually happy that we reached out to them. Um, and again, there have been situations where someone who's not a fan of ours mm -hmm. um, or following us, you know, they're talking about Yankees, I'm sorry about the Yankees. The, the Yankees tickets, you know. <laughs> I don't think they're going to make the play. Anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, they might be talking about Yankees tickets. There was this one woman I remember. Um, and, again, not on our channels, just out there uh, in the social sphere, kind of talking about, you know, I wish I could have taken my son to opening day, you know, at Yankee Stadium. You know, he's 10. He really loves the Yankees. Well, we actually had tickets because the Yankees are part of the Priceless New York. So we actually reached out to that consumer out of the blue and said, we are going to hook you up with Yankees tickets for you and your son. You know, and let me tell you, the goodwill, I mean, because this woman had a huge following. She was telling all her friends and, you know, she was taking pictures and posting it on Instagram. You know, I mean, it just, you know, it, it, it actually, consumers actually are delighted at times. You know, I think that they kind of don't expect a brand, you know, especially if it's a negative comment. They don't expect mm -hmm. a brand to engage with you. And I think that they are happy when you do. Well, if you give so. me Yankee tickets, oh. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you scoop on my Facebook There's all no you more want. Yankee tickets. The Yankees it, are It'll done. be boring if nothing. <laughs> anyway, uh, we have a few minutes. So if anybody has any questions. Oh, here we go. We did have some questions. I got, I got a question. Okay. Um, for one, we do have a tool that that can make it easier and it won't put people out of jobs uh -oh. by the way. Uh -oh. <laughs> because I do I, I, I do I do completely agree that, that humans have to be involved. You you can't completely replace, you know, the human touch as you guys are describing it. But to to the points that you guys are making, I'm curious to know. So you're talking about how receptive people have been when it comes to reactively engaging yeah. with people mm -hmm. as they talk about the brand, even if it's negative. So my question is, you know, what if you take a proactive stand? Mm -hmm. There's all this information out there about these individuals. You can, based on what they've said in the past, based on their behaviors that we talked about downstairs earlier, 
So why not take that data and take a proactive stand? And you could probably know that they love the Yankees mm -hmm. without them even saying they love the Yankees. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, in terms of proactive, we've, I've certainly, we've ex executed proactive mm -hmm. stances. People have never, especially when you're doing a new program, they've mm -hmm. never mentioned it. Certainly they don't go around talking about Pfizer. I, you know, <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, so, you know, and we have reached out proactively. Um, people were generally really surprised and shocked, actually, because mm. we're Pfizer, so everyone can't even really believe that we do social, much less <laughs> engage with influencers online, which we do. Um, so they're really, you know, receptive. The, the worst thing is, I guess, the, you know, the ignore. But if I reach out to mm. people, I expect, like we all do, I think a certain percentage of them are going to email right. me back, and that's mm -hmm. fine. I sort of move on with it. Um, in terms of what you're talking about, which I'm imagining is mining available data, it's not a gay of space that, that we want to or are in any way mm -hmm. interested in playing in. Um, from a, a healthcare company, the concept that we would be interested in collecting anyone's data is pretty much illegal <laughs> um, because it would mean that we would be you know, targeting them, a, a marketing them product, which is something that uh, we don't do. Yeah. So all of our activities are specific that we don't retain that kind of information. Mm -hmm. Even on our website, it has to be built in a certain way that we're not <coughs> trying to get any information from. So it's, that's not what we're, what we're interested in. I think we do learn, um, even in the brand level talking about products, we do learn about people want and they need the, uh, what they put externally. And we've brought them in for several blogger summits around certain disease and, and health mm -hmm. conditions. Uh, but we're not interested in, in sort of the, the back end data search mm -hmm. kind of stuff. It's just not a place that we want to go. <laughs> And I, th I think for us, um, again, we're still new at this. I mean, we just started in 2010. Uh, so we are, I mean, we literally just introduced listening last year, you know. So I think we'll see, you know, that could be like on the horizon, you know, kind of what you're talking about, like kind of data mining. But we also have to be very careful because we do work with the banks and they have traditionally had that direct, and even the merchants have a direct relationship on some level as well, um, because let's face it, you're loyal to a Target or a, you know, a store that you like to, Nordstrom's, you know, if you like to shop there. You know, so again, it could be on the horizon, we're not really doing that right now, uh, just because we're really still trying to refine, you know, the, you know, the current scope of what we're doing, which is, mm -hmm. you know, not only pushing the content and engaging with consumers and listening with consumers. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, you think you had your hand up here and uh, that would be the last question. <laughs> um, I think you made the point earlier that budgets are tight, everyone's fighting for a piece of that pie, and you're both from industries that are highly regulated and have some limitations in terms of social media. So sort of looking forward, do you foresee um, higher investment in your social media departments and your digital voice, or do you think because of your limitations, it'll remain static for a bit in terms of investment? We're, we're always encouraged to do less with more. Um, <laughs> budgets, you know, uh, rarely go up. They're usually kind of flat. Um, so so you're, you're really encouraged to do less with more. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can get lucky. Um, you know, someone may, from another team, kind of recognize, you know what, maybe I don't need this money, maybe I need to help you, you know, so that, that happens. You know, they, they recognize that, you know what, I'm gonna support you, you know, on social, so I'm gonna take a piece of my budget and, and give it over to you. Uh, so that has happened, that's happened this year, last year it's happened. So, um, so yeah, the, the fight continues. Yeah. The budgets never go up. I mean, they never know, go up. We, we <laughs> hope so, I think. And, you know, it's our responsibility to sell, right? It, yeah. and to show the real value of mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, it, it's tough because especially from a corporate level, like Pfizer doesn't sell. We don't make any money. The, the products make money. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I think actually there's a more realization that reputation is, is critically important to who mm -hmm. we are. Um, and... I think there's a little bit of an excitement about social. Yeah. That being said, you know, it's every, you know, right now we're going to have to go go to bat and put together a plan that is excited enough and engaging enough because we, we yeah. do almost all of our social in-house. Uh, we don't have agency support. Mm -hmm. So it, it's mm -hmm. 
we have to go to bat and say, you know, we think we need a new team member. If you guys want us to expand into X, Y, and Z, which yeah. people are always asking for, then this is what it needs. Um, it's like we're selling ourselves. It's almost like when I was in the agency world selling yeah. it to a client. I'm, we're selling it to the higher up saying that, that we need more budget. And if so, we'll, we'll make them happy. Well, thank you very much, Brenna Robinson and Elaine Lawson. Thank you. Thank you for your questions.